Hello everyone and welcome to Uncivil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. If you're enjoying our legal education content, please subscribe, it helps the channel grow. For today's case, we are dealing with Prenda Law and the criminal sanctions thereof. This has to deal with some attorneys who basically trolled everyone uh, for copyright infringement, but it wasn't really copyright infringement, they were just behaving badly. And they're also lying to courts and deceiving the US government on a whole bunch of things. It didn't end well, and the Court of Appeals has now rendered a decision on the criminal aspects relating to this, which might finally be the end, hopefully, maybe question mark. So we'll see about all that. But for the moment, we have to discuss the case of the United States of America versus Paul Hannensmere. In this case, Prenda Law is getting busted and going to jail and has to pay money, and they're sad. And so we're going to read about a whole bunch of shit they did to recap everyone on this case and then find out what happened here specifically. Let's get started with this. Paul Hassemer was an attorney licensed to practice law in Minnesota. Along with his business partner, John Steele, who was in charge in the same indictment, Hassemer operated the firm of Steele Hassemer, a PLLC. Beginning around September of 2010, the firm began starting representing organizations and individuals that own the copyright to certain adult movies. As part of this representation, Hansmeer and Steele pursued the following strategy as described in the indictment. Defendants and their agents monitored file-sharing websites and obtained IP addresses of individuals who downloaded or attempted to download their clients' movies. Defendants then filed copyright infringement lawsuits against these anonymous individuals, sometimes referred to as John Doe's, and sought authority from the court, often referred to as early discovery, to subpoena internet service providers for subscriber information associated with the address. After receiving that information, defendants made phone calls and sent letters to subscribers associated with the addresses in which they threatened overwhelming financial penalties. The copyright statute permits plans to recover damages of up to $150,000 per infringement and public disclosure, unless those purported infringers agree to pay a settlement of approximately $4,000. Many of the individuals who received the letters and phone calls agreed to pay the settlement rather than incurring the expense of defending the lawsuit, which would have undoubtedly exceeded the settlement amount or risk being publicly shamed for allegedly downloading pornographic movies. So these, these attorneys came up with a genius business idea. Genius business idea. What if we, uh, which is also criminal, we'll get to the criminal aspect of it, so not so genius, but they came up with the idea of monitoring people for downloading movies and then threatening them. It's like, first of all, it costs you money, and second of all, you'll get exposed. So you want to give us the $4,000 or not? So that was their business plan. Somehow it manages to get worse from there. We're going to read more about that. The indictment alleges that Hansmeer and Steele started by monitoring file-sharing websites to look up potential infringers. Beginning in April of 2011, however, the two men began directing their agents to upload their clients' adult movies to BitTorrent file-sharing websites, including a website named The Pirate Bay, in order to entice people to download the movies and make it easier to catch those who obtained the movies. Once Hansmeyer and Steele identified potential infringers who downloaded the movies, they took the same steps of seeking early discovery, sending settlement demands, and receiving payments from alleged infringers. Hansmeyer and Steele told neither the courts in which they sought discovery, nor alleged infringers, and this would be the first part of why this business scheme was not such a great idea, that they were responsible for making the films available on the file-sharing sites. So this would be the first problem among many. They were the ones that were making the files available. Now, that's a kind of a critical detail because that might suggest that they're authorizing their download, right? Because if the person who owns the copyright or has the power to speak for it, the attorney makes it available and you download it, then that might not be infringement because you're downloading from someone who authorizedly put it up. And so they never told them about that. They never told the courts. They never told the people. And they never did anything. They held, they had held that detail, detail, which might be a pretty critical detail. This is not the first nor last thing that's going to be a problem, but yeah, that's not good. Several months later, Hansmeyer and Steele again modified their strategy. First, in November 2011, they caused Prenda Law to be created. Though the firm was nominally owned by an associate, the two men exerted de facto control over it and used the firm to pursue their copyright infringement litigation. So they started a second firm to, to cover these stories called Prenda. So Prenda Law enters the picture in 2011. That's how long this has been going on, man. It's been going on forever. Though the firm was nominally on, on they directed control. The indictment alleges that Hans Meyer Steele on mobile occasions falsely denied to various courts a direct involvement with or control over Prenda. 
Next, they created the organizations AF Holding and Ingenuity 13. Hansmeyer and Steele represented to the court that these organizations were owned and controlled by other individuals and used their names of an acquaintance and by paralegal they employed. But in reality, Hansmeyer and Steele controlled both. So, yeah, they tried to, because before they were running it out of the, their own law firm, which was named after them. So it made it a little bit, it made it hard to deny. So what they said was like, aha, what if we created a different law firm? It wasn't named after us. And it's ostensibly run by this guy who we know nothing about. And this guy's their associate, but we have no control except we have control. And also we're going to lie to every court ever about it. That's not really the greatest plan I've ever heard when it comes to uh, legal representation. So, you know, that's super fun. So now it somehow gets even more interesting. So in May 2012, Hans Meyer and Steele began creating adult movies themselves. So we've moved from running it through our own law firm to running it through a shadow law firm to let's create our own content. Fun. Contracting with adult film actresses, Hans Meyer and Steele produced multiple short films and transferred copyrights to Ingenuity 13, which again, they controlled. They did not distribute these movies commercially, okay? They, did, they didn't make them available. Instead, posted them exclusively in file-sharing websites and monitored the download. The only purpose of this was as a honey trap. Okay. Using these entities in films, Hans Meyer and Steele continued to pursue their settlement-focused litigation strategy. In doing so, they failed to disclose their involvement to either the courts or the infringers. Again, this is kind of a problem because, you know, lawyers have a, have a duty of candor to the tribunal. It's actually in the ethics were written that way. Lawyers have a duty of candor to the tribunal because we're officers of the court. We can't lie. We can't lie. Yeah. We, we can make things look better and make things look worse, but we can't lie. So when they ask a question like, are you behind this? No, we've never heard about where these movies come from. Have no clue. Except for the fact that I was basically behind the camera the whole time and directing, but you know, never mind all that. So it just kind of completely lied to the court and who cares about the rest, man. The indictment alleges that in order to carry out their litigation strategy, Hans Meyer and Steele de de deceived both courts in which they sought discovery and the alleged infringers they sued. Specifically in the indictment accuses Hans Meyer and Steele of deliberately concealing from the courts their role in distributing the pulp movies, as well as significant personal stake in the outcome of litigation. This concealment, the indictment alleges, was done with the purpose of gaining access to downloaders identifying information in order to garner quick settlements from individuals who were unaware of defendant's role in uploading the movie and offered either too embarrassed or could not afford to defend themselves. The indictment also characterizes the Thren lawsuit as legally baseless, suggesting that Hansmeyer and Steele had provided legal authorization to download the movies, when they cause them to upload them to fairness, file sharing sites, which, you know, is a tenable position. They're the ones who created the content. They're the ones who put it on the file sharing service. So therefore, they're implicitly authorizing download. Or at least it's arguable. And yeah. According to the indictment claims, any representation of Hansmeyer and Steele made the courts or the infringers that they and their clients have legitimately copyright infringement claims or had suffered indigement and damages from the indictment were false. But wait, it gets worse. Around October 2012, after courts had begun limiting discovery they could obtain through these infringement suits, Hans Meyer Steele developed a new way to seek settlements. So the courts are locking down on them. And rather than reevaluate their cause of action, they decide how about double down. This involved the creation of three new organizations, Guava, LimeWire Holdings, and LW Systems, as with AF Holdings and Ingenuity 13. Though Hans Meyer and Steele represented that these companies were owned by other individuals, not so much because they actually controlled them. Under the new strategy, Hans Meyer and Steele filed lawsuits alleging that certain John Doe's had hacked these computer systems. Hacked it. This, the indictment claimed, was a lie. While the John Doe's in question had apparently downloaded the films, they had not hacked into any systems. Indeed, the company had no computer systems for her to, to, to hack. So we have moved. We have moved in the chain of doubling down and doubling down and doubling down our criminal indictment. We've moved from running it out of our law firm to creating a new law firm, to creating the movies, to creating different companies to allege that there was um, hacking. Now, every, you know, there's a, there's a well-known saying, 
there's a well-known belief among lawyers that you pretty much never get charged with the first crime you do, particularly white collar, right? I, I've, I, I, I remember having conversations with SEC lawyers, for example, just because I happened to be in bar conferences with them. So, you know, I just remember having discussions with SEC lawyers because they happened to be there. I would talk about this. And I asked them one time, it's like, have you ever seen like the first time offender? And they're like, no, we've never seen it. You know, it's always their eighth crime. And then we start, and then they get someone's attention. And then we look back and we find them all. You know, it's always them getting bolder and bolder and bolder. We've never really seen the the one the one and done. So that's basically the lesson from today, among other things. Is like, you know, I don't know exactly where along the line they were going to get busted, but somewhere along the line, they went too far, and then everyone has an interest to look back. So they went too deep, man, and it didn't end well. In reality, according to the indictment, Hammersmeer and Steele brought these lawsuits in a renewed attempt to learn the identities of alleged infringers and send them settlement demands. In this effort, Hammersmeer and Steele recruited Ruse defendants. These defendants were people Hammersmeer and Steele had caught downloading movies for which they, or purported clients, possessed copyright. In exchange for Hammersmeer and Steele waiving copyright claims against them, the Ruse defendants agreed to be sued for hacking the company's computer systems. This then allowed the two men to seek discovery about the ruse defendants' alleged co-conspirators in the computer hacking. In reality, these co-conspirators were just other defendants of copyright movies, while IP addresses Hammersmeal Steel identified through the shites. Once Hammersmeal Steel gathered subpoena authority for the co-conspirators, they sent them the same basic settlement as before. Okay, I kind of like this in its creativity. I like this in its creativity. It's very, very funny. Or it's very interesting as how it's done. It's like, so the courts have begun to look skeptically at us requesting IP addresses. They're looking at it a little bit weird. So we come up with a new strategy. We're going to pick a defendant, any defendant. doesn't really matter. We're going to pick them and we're going to sue them for hack. Or we're going to sue them for copyright infringement. And they're going to panic and say, okay, here's what our offer. We'll settle with you if you agree to allow us to go after your co-conspirators. And you're like, and they're like, of course I do. And you're like, great. So you're off the hook and then you follow discovery. It's like, okay, great. I want, I want to get access to the co-conspirators, which are other people were downloading it, which is just the IP addresses. It's another way to get it. I like the creativity and the mechanism. The fact that you're having to come up with this creativity and circumventing the rules though is, is, um, devious and, uh, illegal, but there's something, uh, admirable about the creativity at least. So I eh, got that going for you. Yeah. Way to get around limited discovery, right? Should come. I mean, there's something. I mean, you know, the one things, one of the best things you can say to a lawyer is how creative they are, because especially if you're in a, if, if you're in a position that's weak, if you're in a weak position, you have to come up with really creative stuff. So one of the best compliments, compliments for a lawyer is that they're creative because they were able to solve a problem that was insoluble. And I've had a few things like that in my own career, but it's like, yeah, that's where you really, it's like, can I f solve a problem that has no solution? And so there's something admirable about that. It's like, as a fellow lawyer, I look at that, I'm like, okay, you had a problem and you figured a way to solve it. Unfortunately, it was criminal, but there's something still, uh, I don't know, something in there somewhere. Eventually, the courts grew suspicious of Hammerspear and Steele's litigation techniques and start denying the subpoena requests, dismissing lawsuits, imposing sanctions, and notifying state attorney disciplinary boards and other courts. The indictment includes language from a federal district court order imposing sanctions against both men, in which the court states that two have demonstrated their willingness to deceive not just this court, but other courts where they've appeared, and that the deception was calculated so the court would grant early discovery requests, thereby allowing them to identify the settlement proceeds from them. The responses from the courts effectively ended Hammersmears and Steele's operation, but between 2011 and 2013, before they faced this increased scrutiny, Hammersmith Steel and their entities received more than $6 million in copyright settlements, half of which went to Hammersmith and Steel themselves. To prove the existence of a fraudulent scheme, the government must establish there's a deliberate plan of action or course of conduct to hide or misrepresent information, the hidden or misrepresent information was material, and the purpose was to get someone to act on it. As this definition indicates for criminal liability to attach, a scheme to defraud must consist of material misrepresentations. Misrepresentations have a natural tendency to influence and are capable of influencing the decision of decision-making by to which they're addressed.
Hammersmeyer's indictment identifies two related litigation strategies that Hammersmeyer and Steele employed between late 2011 and 2013, and that form the basis of government fraud allegation. Both meet the elements of fraud scheme. In the first, Hammersmeyer and Steele brought copyright infringement lawsuits and requested discovery on behalf of their supposed clients, seeking the identities of alleged copyright infringers, but did not disclose their directed agents to make the copyright rights available, which might, su might suggest uh, consent for the people who download them, or, and that their companies were in fact companies that Hammersmeyer and Steele set up in order to personally profit. On the face of it, the alleged conduct meets the requirements for the fraudulent scheme. Finally, the indictment makes clear that the purpose of Hammersmeyer and Steele's concealment was to induce the courts to act in the firm of granting their subpoena requests. And the ultimate object of those requests and deceptive tactics leading up to them was to obtain settlement payments from a pool of alleged infringers. Pointing the different elements together, the indictment alleges that Hammersmeyer and Steele developed and executed a plan that depended on them, deliberately concealing material information from the courts, with the purpose of convincing the courts to grant discovery and with the ultimate object of obtaining settlement payments from the alleged infringers they identified. This conduct meets the requirements of criminalized fraud. Thus, that brings us to the end of the discussion of Prenda Law in the United States of America versus Paul Hassemer. In this case, Prenda Law basically defrauded a whole bunch of people by first going through their own law firm and then creating the Prenda Law law firm and then filming their own adult content, and then accusing people of hacking when they didn't. And the courts are not happy, so these people have been disbarred, and they're going to jail, and they're getting fined, and all the rest of it, and maybe this will bring us to the end of Prenda Law, but we'll see. But for the moment, at least, it brings us to the end of the discussion of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. If you enjoyed this legal education content, please hit the subscribe button. It really helps the channel grow. We appreciate your continuing support. And until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye. Okay, first time bank robbers get caught. Okay, I mean, give me a break.